In recognition of his outstanding career in public service as mayor of the city of Newark, New Jersey Institute of Technology is pleased to confer the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, upon the Honorable Corey A. Booker. So let me invite uh, Mayor Booker to present the commencement address to the class of 2009. I know uh, there are some people out there thinking I should be humbled and grateful, humbled because I am not the President of the United States and grateful that this is not Arizona State University. <laughs> but uh, the truth of the matter is I am humbled and grateful because of what this university is. The history of our city and this university since 1881 have been tightly linked. This university started as a very local school with a mission, and it has remained a local school rooted in the city to make contributions profound and purposeful, but it has also become a university with a global impact. I'm so grateful to be here today to continue this tradition of a close link between a great global university and a great city as well. I want to thank the faculty and the trustees. I want to thank my friend and Newark resident, President Altenkirk, for bestowing this honor on me. I also want to give acknowledgement to the families that are here. None of these students here is an island unto themselves. Every single member of the class of 2009 is but yet the tip of a peak of a larger mountain range. They're all here because of your support. They're here because of your love. They're here because of all you have done to empower them to succeed. Parents and uncles and aunts and cousins and close family friends, all of you today should be celebrating, not at individual students' accomplishments, but the collective accomplishment of a strong community. Now, I have to give you all thanks because none of you are behaving like my family did on every single graduation I went to. My family is, has a record in New Jersey as being the most obnoxious graduation family there ever was. They were the loudest screamers. They had to be asked to leave a few times. They got involved in scandals when some of my graduations only allowed two or three people to come in and issue tickets. They got caught up in counterfeit scandals that have brought shame to the Booker name. <laughs> On the outdoor graduations with their unbelievable paparazzi that could put any Hollywood gaggle of photographers to shame, they would rip out a number of cameras so extraordinary that when they began to take pictures, the FAA started complaining because they were blinding incoming flights to Newark Airport. <laughs> and then when they started calling names and giving graduations and the screaming and the yelling and the chanting and the attempts to start the wave in various auditoriums and stadiums, then they would descend upon me as I walked off the stage to give me first an array of jokes which I heard from my eighth grade graduation all the way through grad school. My grandfather would trot up and say, you see boy, the tassel is worth the hassle. <laughs> oh, this time you didn't graduate magna cum laude or summa cum laude, you were just thank you laude, I got out of here. <laughs> My father began to get distressed that I continued to stay in school year after year, graduation after graduation. He's like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, and you're not hot. But then they would give me the advice. I would hear it from family members and from important, extraordinary individuals in my life, and I tell you, there was a lot of it. You're going to get advice all your life, class of 2009. Some of it will be contradictory. Haste makes waste. Carpe diem sees the day. But I can tell you now, after going through a graduation numerous times, that there has been two pieces of advice that have been most important to me. 
The first would come often from my grandfather who would ask me to be me. He said, be courageous, stand up for who you are. It's not as important in life what you do as in who you are and how you live your life. This to me is an extraordinarily important lesson. We live in a world with powerful cultural streams that will try to erode the bedrock of who you are. But you must understand, each and every one of you has a genius inside of you. You cannot give in. You cannot resign yourself. You must stand up and manifest the truth of your being. To thine own self be true. This is critical in a world that is desperate for change. You know the saying that says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world as it is. The unreasonable man insist that the world adapt itself to him. Therefore, all progress is made by the unreasonable man. Be that unreasonable person. Insist that the world changes. Make sure that in every step you take, you are manifesting your truth and your essence, infusing a moment with who you are. There's that great story about Gandhi where he was sitting in his tent weaving cloth, people waiting to see him, and a woman walks in with her small child and says, Mahatma, you emphasize dietary discipline. My son eats way too much candy, way too much sugar. Would you please tell him to stop eating sugar? And Gandhi looks at her kindly with compassion and simply says, no, I won't. She starts to protest, but he says, no, come back in two months. The woman obeys and leaves, and two months later, she waits in the hot Indian sun, gets to the tent with her child and says, Mahatma, I am back. My son is still has horrible dietary habits. Would you please talk to him, get him to stop eating sugar? Mahatma Gandhi looks at her kindly, and he stood up and walked over to the boy, laid his hand upon his shoulder and says, my son, you must stop eating sugar. The boy was obviously affected. The mother was happy. They turned to leave, and then she stopped, and she said, now, now wait a minute. Why didn't you just tell my son to stop eating sugar two months ago? And Gandhi said, because two months ago, I was eating sugar. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, the best way to make change in this world is to be loyal to your truth, and it will radiate out in ways that are so powerful. In matters of faith, St. Francis said, everywhere I go, I preach the gospel, but only sometimes do I use words. When it comes to parenthood, James Baldwin said, children are never good at listening to their elders, but they never fail to imitate them. All that you do will emanate not from what you say, not from your occupation, but how you live every moment. And every single moment is a gift this present, you have a choice to make. How will you live? Will you live with light or give in to the darkness? Will you live with faith or give in to the despair? Will you live with hope or give in to the doubt? I remember after my high school graduation, I was getting on a plane to go to my university. I was heading out to Stanford, a cross-country flight, and I had done it many times visiting family, and I got the greatest blessing when the airplane doors closed. I in a packed plane, had the only two seats open right next to me. My conversations with God at that point were wonderful. God, you are looking upon your favorite son. Thank you so much. As a six foot three, soon to be tight end, I could stretch out and just relax. And then all of a sudden I heard the doors of the plane open again to let the last passenger on. But this passenger was not alone. I heard what must have been a nuclear powered speaker because the wailing and the screaming of the baby that this woman was carrying shook the whole plane. And everybody looked suddenly much more satisfied than me because they knew that woman would not be sitting next to them. <laughs> My conversations with God changed. I looked up at the Lord and said, dear God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this woman carrying this huge woofer and tweeter, <laughs> escorting a toddler, come the three bodies to sit right down next to me. And I sat there, angry and frustrated at the God that had betrayed his son. And then in the midst of my frustration, I realized I had a choice. 
this moment could either be one of the worst of my life or I could try to make it my best. And I decided to make it my best. And I just turned around and said, how are you doing? And she looked embarrassed and she was trying to get her baby to be quiet. I made every funny face I could at that child. And we started talking and laughing and she started to relax. I started playing with a toddler tic-tac-toe. I started playing hangman. I started telling that child every bad joke I had. Like the, the tomato family that was walking down the street, baby tomato kept falling behind and mama went back and stepped on baby tomato and said, catch up. <laughs> I said there were bad jokes. Like why did Tigger and Eeyore have their heads in the toilet? They were looking for poo. Okay, they don't go over good at a graduation, but they were working. I was working it. I was killing that aisle in the airplane. And we were having a good time. We landed. We exchanged information. I got one or two crayon letters from the little boy, and my life went on. Five years passed, 10 years passed, 15 years passed, and now I was trying to live my truth. I was trying to be who I felt called to be. I was running for mayor of New Jersey's largest city, and I was getting it handed to me. It was difficult, hard to find allies, hard to raise money, hard to get campaign volunteers. And I get a letter in the mail saying, Councilman Booker, you may not remember me, but 15 years ago, I met you on an airplane. It was my first flight with my children, and it was so difficult until we encountered your kindness. She said, by the way, we own a factory here in Newark. We have employees I would love to come have you come speak to. In fact, we would like to donate money to your campaign. And that toddler that you met, he's now a grown young man, and he wants to volunteer on your campaign. The universe is a balanced place. If you give in to those forces that so often consume you in the moment, you will miss your opportunity to make your impact. Life is not about the big victory. It is about step by step, brick by brick, building a monument to the truth of who you are. But the second piece of advice from my family on graduation day is perhaps my favorite. You see, my grandfather would grip me hard by the arm and tell me simply, boy, never forget that the degree you hold was paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears of your ancestors. You are a part of something, Cory Booker. Don't forget who you are and from whence you come. Class of 2009, this is critical. You all come from a hollowed history. Whether there's a personal story of your family, whether they're immigrants from a foreign land or folks coming up, working class families, whatever your background is, it is extraordinary. There has been an entire conspiracy of history that has led to this moment. You stand on the shoulders of greatness. You drink deeply from wells that you did not dig. You eat fruit from trees that your hands did not plant. You have to understand your place in history. As NJIT graduates, Understand the truth of this university and what it stands for. Our university began with 88 students, Newark residents, with a mission to train individuals to lead, to contribute, to serve. You're also Americans and part of a great American story that is unfinished, a country that was formed in perfect ideals but a savagely imperfect reality, a democracy that had lofty aims but was mired in bigotry and hatred and violence and inequities. You're part of a history of ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things to make real on that democracy. And you yourself now must choose to be a part of this unfolding story because America still has challenges. In fact, they are growing. We're facing pandemics. We're facing fear and poverty and inequity still in this day. You must take up the charge, swear the oath like the great poet Langston Hughes did, who simply said, oh, let America be America again the land that never has been yet, but yet must be, the land where everyone is free, the poor man, the Indian, the Negro, me. Who made America? 
whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must make our mighty dream live again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, but I swear this oath, America will be. You, you class of 2009 are a part of a larger picture. You are a part of an incredible story. You now must take up your place in this story, write the next chapter, but no, you are not going to do it alone. We may have a declaration of independence from our founding, but the truth of America is a declaration of interdependence. We need each other. All that we are is because individuals stood up and worked together. This university is a product of civic leaders, philanthropists, students, laborers, politicians, all coming together to make this university possible and therefore this day possible. In my life, I've had many extraordinary moments that have been blessings, but perhaps the greatest thing that happened to me came at my lowest moment. I was a frustrated first-term councilman in my first year here in Newark, feeling like I was getting nothing done, wondering why I had chosen to get involved in politics in the first place. On the worst day after a long year, in the heat of the summer, I got a call from a dear friend of mine named Elaine Sewell. She is a profound woman of dignity and honor, and she called me up angry at me because of some of the violence that was happening in her community. She lived in these high-rises called Garden Spires, and I was so frustrated that she was asking me for help because I felt like I could do nothing for her. I was having my own problems with the city's mayor at that time, and I was having my car ticketed everywhere I parked in the city, including when I parked in front of City Hall with the other council people. And here she's asking me to get the police to come out there, and I'm like, I can't even get the cops to stop ticketing my car. I can't get them up there to help you. We got angry at each other, and we hung up the phone, and I went home, and there I was met by yet another tenant leader in Newark. One of those pieces of advice my parents would give me and my family would give me when I graduated was saying, hey, this is a great university, but never forget you can learn more from a woman on the fifth floor of the projects than you ever can from one of those fancy professors. And lo and behold, as I'm walking home, I meet this woman from the fifth floor of Brick Towers. And she looks at me as if I'm frustrated and says, Corey, what's wrong? And I tell her how frustrated I am. I tell her I think I'm wasting my time as a councilman. I tell her about what's happening with Elaine Sewell. And she almost seems like she's enlightened. She's like, hey, wait, I know what you should do. I'm like, well, what should I do? She goes, yep, I, I know exactly what you should do. And I'm like, what should I do? And she looks at me almost as if she's about to say the most profound and wise thing in the world. She says, you should do something. <laughs> and I'm like, that's it? And she goes, that's it. I was now angry at another woman in my life. I turned around and stormed away from her, but as I meditated on what she said, I decided to give in, to give up, and just try to live an honest and sincere truth. I called a friend and we set up a tent out at Garden Spires and I went over to Lane Sewell and I apologized to her for being wrong on the phone. I said, Ms. Sewell, I don't know how we're gonna solve the problems here, but I'll tell you what, we're gonna do uh, something. And I said to her that I would ask that she get a few residents just to pray with me every day. And I said, on top of that, I will choose not to eat any food until we come up with some sound solutions. We held a press conference and I said to the press that came, I said, this is the United States of America, how can we have people living in fear or concern for their safety and that of their families? I challenge you to interview someone who lives here who you ignore unless somebody gets shot and then you pour in here with your cameras a blare. And they did that, they interviewed it, they put it on the news, I slept in the tent that night after an initial prayer, everybody was not happy to see me and some biological substances fell on the top of the tent from the top of the floor of the buildings, but the next morning I saw the truth I'm trying to express to you. The first people to come out to the tent were these 12 big guys, they were correctional officers from a local facility, they were prison guards, and they told me you're not going to stay out here alone. 
The next group that came out were some, some residents from around the city. In fact, a great minister that's still a good friend of mine, Pastor Reddick, he came out with some other ministers and said, you're fasting and praying every day? We're in on this. And he joined me in what we were doing. Before you knew it, we had people coming from all around the city. Even the mayor of West Orange came down to help out. We had hospitals coming to help to do screenings for elders and children. We had businesses coming out and doing job fairs. Before you knew it, this two acres of concrete were full of activity, full of people trying to help, full of folks working together. We had a guy in New York that saw what was going on, and he saw hundreds of people out there, and he sent out about 500 pizzas to feed everybody. And I have to say I was kind of ticked off because I was on a hunger strike. By the 10th day, the mayor of the city, who at that point many thought was an adversary of mine, but I tell you, when the two of us came together under this tent with hundreds of people around me, I looked at him as just another spirit walking with me forward. We hugged each other, and he turned around and said that he was going to build a park right where he stood. He said that he was going to keep police out there. The owners of the building announced that they were going to do some security work and make investments and make things better. But this is not the concluding point of my story. You see, things did not turn around overnight in Garden Spire. Some improvements were made, but there were still challenges. The point of my story I want to get to was the last prayer. You see, I stood there and I looked around me, and there was an audience around me that looked like the people in this arena. People from every single background people from many different faiths. There were believers and non-believers. There were Jews and Christians and Muslims. There were imams and rabbis and priests. And we all held hands. And at that moment of holding hands, I felt stronger than I had ever felt in my life. I felt energy coursing through my body. And as people began to pray, I heard Arabic and Spanish and English and Hebrew, but as I held harder onto those hands, feeling the energy of the moment, feeling what was the truth of our being, I began to hear the echoes of our ancestors. I heard the old Ethiopian saying that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. I heard the old East African saying that says, sticks in a bundle can't be broken. I heard the Muslim phrase, taweed, that means we are all one human family with one soul. I heard the words of a great Israeli leader that said, Jews together are strong, but Jews with other people are invincible. And I heard those three Latin utterances that are the hallmark of a people. E pluribus unum. 2009, you all are a great class. You're about to emerge into a great world. There is one challenge that you must meet. It is to love yourself enough to be true to who you are in every single moment and to love your fellow person enough to join with them in a cause that is greater than you. This is what's called, is to stand up with your love. If you love like that, you will make change. And you must have that love because people loved you. They fought for you. They bled for you. They cried for you. You must love because as King says, change will not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It must be carried in on the backs of soldiers of love. You must love fearlessly and recklessly and courageously and persistently. And if you love with that kind of strength, if you love with that kind of honor, then we will transform our world and make it a more perfect reflection of those who inhabit it. This is your challenge. This is your calling. This, I believe, class of 2009, is your great destiny. Thank you very much.